Succession management, as we said, has a foot both in internal staffing as well as training and development. Um, succession management means that we have a systematic way of identifying, assessing, and developing our internal employees to get them ready for greater and greater leadership opportunities. And so we are working through succession management to help develop their leadership skills um, so that they are ready for a promotion if a, if a vacancy opens up. Companies that tend to be really good at succession management have very little um, disruptions of uh, continuity of business. For example, um, if you have a CEO that dies or leaves suddenly for any host of reasons, do you have somebody ready to step in to take the place and is an internal candidate? Um, and if you don't, you may have to look um, to have an interim in place for a while or bring in an external candidate if your internal people aren't ready. Or in worst case scenario, you might, you might satisfy and promote somebody who's not ready to be a CEO, which can actually cause more damage than you would, you would necessarily want. So <clears throat> succession management um, is really it depends on us. A good succession management depends on us being able to identify people um, uh, that are good and ready for promotion, that we can identify the gaps in their skills so that we can make sure that they are developed and ready to go if the opportunity arises. Um, and we want to keep them engaged and excited in the business so that they don't leave with all the skill sets that we want, that we've spent time uh, and years investing in um, for that, um, that promotional opportunity. Um, succession manage management plans are those written policies and guides. And so what is your policy. You have to write that policy in place. What skill sets do you expect at every level? How are you going to prepare them? All those details that will go into um, how you're going to manage a succession management plan. So you have to have that written down. And then the replacement planning is basically the, the um, creating a backup system, right? So I, this is the person who would step in here, but these are other people that could be ready. Um, but we're going to make sure that they have the skills that they need. And this is the plan that we're engaging in to develop them. So they are ready then as a backup plan. And the whole idea of a succession management plan is really a backup plan. It's if this person leaves, who's ready to do that? And if that person leaves, who's ready to do the next position? And if that person goes, who's ready for the next level? And so you have this all the way down from the top to the bottom of the company. As complex as it sounds, if you make the initial effort to get a plan in place and then becomes self-sustaining. You know, you um, getting it established is the hard part, but once you get it established, um, it, 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 it works really well and it really facilitates smoother transitions and better development of an internal labor market in your company. Table or figure 10.2 is a great example of what your succession management database could or should look like. For example, we have a particular position, a customer service manager, and so you have one column that identifies who's in the position right now. Peter Fry. Peter Fry's been there. What's the pos What's the probability or the possibility that Peter is going to leave the company? Um, and we usually have a good sense of whether or not someone is ambitious and ready to leave, and they want they're looking elsewhere. You know, we you know we it's easy to find out that information whether or not someone is a high turnover risk, and so we assess whether or not. Um, they're likely to leave. Um, and then from there, we have to make sure we've got people in line ready to go if Peter Fry decides to leave the company for any, any reason, whether Peter Fry is promoted to a different position or laterally transferred to a different permit position or exits the company entirely. So, you know, this company has identified three possible applicants. Um, uh, Amy Finn, John McCarthy and Sarah Menendez. And for each one of those, the potential successors, you should be able to identify what their strengths and weaknesses are. What are what are the things they're good at and where are the gaps that they need to develop and have more practice in. So for Sarah Menendez, she's a great leader. She's got great customer service skills, but according to this, she needs more budget experience. And so Peter Fry's responsibility or HR's responsibility is reaching out to Peter and saying, we want to make sure Sarah gets more budgeting experience. So can you make sure that she has opportunities to work with you on budget management? And that's what you um, make sure that Sarah and Peter 
both understand that this is this needs to happen so that Sarah ha gets the learning that she needs to be ready for a promotion if it pops up. Um, and then you also have to look at successor readiness. Um, and, and part of it is based on what skills they need, but also how long do you think it'll take before that skill set will come together. Um, in this situation, both Amy and Sarah are within three to six months of being ready um, to be promoted to a new opportunity. Clearly, Amy has some things that she probably needs to work on, too, although we don't have access to that in this particular database. But um, the successor readiness um, gives us a, a timeline in which we probably need to address all the skills that they need in that gap. Um, to, to meet the gap um, so that they're ready to step in for a promotional opportunity. John McCarthy is a little bit more behind Amy and Sarah. He's about six to 12 months out, which probably means he has more things that he needs to develop. But either Amy or Sarah, depending on which one gets the experience that they need quicker and which one perhaps is maybe going to be a better manager of people, um, both of those would be ready for the next promotion upward. Um, so those are, the, those are the kinds of things you want to see in your database. Um, and so you have to develop a good database system so that you can click on Sarah's name and, and you then know what, what skills that Sarah has and what skill sets does she need in order to be eligible for promotion. Um, and, and that's where you would work with your human resource information system and your IT department to come up with a good succession management database to make that happen. Or you can go to an external vendor and have, and have them uh, buy you a, 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 a succession management database um, software. Um, because such things, of course, I'm, uh, exist. Table 10.2 in your textbook in Chapter 10 uh, goes over the steps in developing a succession management system, and this is a great resource here. Um, number one, assess and uh, assess current and future competencies, behaviors, and values that are going to be needed for job performance in a particular position. And so you might work, for example, with Peter Fry from our previous slide, uh, who is the current uh, customer service manager in that position, and fi figuring out what are the skills that are going to be needed and also to anticipate what we think might be needed in the future if we expect a change in that position for some reason. Um, sometimes uh, new technologies are in invested or new ideas and new approaches to doing things are invested. So we, we use this opportunity to um, investigate um, what we think we need in terms of skills and abilities. Then we assess and identify each candidate's strengths and weaknesses and their readiness to be promoted, as we saw from the previous slide. We create a plan to continually and systematic improve those capabilities of all of those um, succession candidates so that all three of those people that were identified as successors in the previous slide to Peter Fry um, had a plan in place to develop them and that everybody is following that. So we want to also create a plan to identify qualified and interested internal candidates for open positions. And so it's not just about looking at the succession plan, but it's also about opening up and, and broadening our view of who might be appropriate for a, for a promotion into that position. It might be a lateral transfer from another department. It may not be somebody who is directly below you know, the job incumbent, right? It might be somebody who works in a different department that has the same skill set, basic skill set that could easily move into this position with a little bit of support. Um, so we're not necessarily limited to just people who are below. We want to then evaluate the, the system on our criteria, all the metrics that we think are important, um, particularly with, you know, are, are we able to fill our uh, internal positions with internal candidates. I mean, particularly if that is what we're airing this on the side of, is making sure we've got internal candidates in place. Lastly, we want to make sure we're continually improving our system. Don't assume just because you've got a system that works today or even in the next six months that it's going to work a year from now or two years from now or three years from now. So don't get locked into it's the way we've always done it, so therefore we're going to continue to do it that way because we know that the life changes, business changes, the, the industry changes, and we need to change with those changes. And so all our HR systems need to follow those industry norms and changes. The most effective way to engage in succession management is to not be reactive, but to actually be proactive. I mean, that just sounds like a no-brainer, but oftentimes people 
forget about all those basic things that they need to do and they tend to take a more reactive approach to things. Succession management works well when we plan in advance. If we can identify in advance where the skill gaps are so that if something comes up, we are prepared and ready to go. Um, obviously, even the best laid plans can fall apart. Um, a CEO can die suddenly um, and suddenly even though you had a good plan in place and everybody was moving forward at a good at a good rate in terms of being developed, the bottom line is those emergencies and crises are not things we can always plan for. So our goal is to do the best we can to plan for, you know, any um, uh, any uh, uh, challenges that may be ahead of us or any talent gaps that we expect. So we have to plan for and remedy any deficiencies on a regular basis. Always be looking at where the deficiencies are and keeping people developed. We want to make sure we're developing an internal, external recruiting strategy to bring in talent from the outside, even if we don't have the talent inside. So it is okay to say, we don't have it in-house. We're not going to have enough time to develop this in-house. We need to go out outside of the company to find the talent that we need. Um, so that's a concern. And again, if you're not doing a good job of managing in, in your internal talent, you will have to turn to external talent more often than not. So if you want to keep a good internal labor market, then you want to make sure that you are um, and, and minimize your external hiring. It doesn't You don't want to get rid of it because you need to have heterogeneity in your company, but to continue to benefit those internally, um, we want to make sure we've got uh, we're proactively identifying where our talent caps are. We want to be able to redesign work to reduce the need for talent expected to be in short supply. So it, is there a way that we can redesign what we do, how we do it, why we do it? So understanding all those things, we can re-engineer re the way we do things to minimize our talent need. Because um, again, if, if we find that we're going to have a great need for talent and we don't have enough people to do it, it's really important for us to figure out alternative ways to meet those gaps. And lastly, make sure we have alternative career plans when we have surplus talent. The last thing you want is a situation where you have developed a whole bunch of people and then one person gets promoted, which is great, but everybody else who's been sitting there ready for that promotional opportunity no longer have um, you know, any chance in the short term to find that they're going to get promoted. So you need to find alternative ways to keep them interested and engaged with the company, have an alternative career path for them so that you enable um, uh, them to, um, to stay with the company and feel engaged with the company. Effective succession management systems, like anything else we do in HR, has to be standardized. So we want to have an, a system that's standardized across all levels of employees, different areas, different locations, different geographic areas. Um, because the goal here is when we have a standardized process that's related and in an alignment back with the organization's uh, corporate strategy and the direction that they want to head into and making sure all that we do is in alignment with that that and make sure that we have a, a really strong system in place with all that standardization. Um, it also improves perceptions of fairness if they know that no matter where they're at they're going to be treated consistently and fairly. Um, so that consistency and standardization of what to expect is really important. If we start having different standards in different locations people will assume favoritism is kicking in or nepotism is is kicking in um, and then we have problems with disgruntled internal employees which can be much more dangerous to us than disgruntled external employees. Again the goal is also not just to be in alignment with the corporate strategy but that other aspects of HR are in alignment with this as well so that our recruitment and selection strategy, our compensation and pay for performance reward system is in alignment, our training and performance management systems are all in alignment. All of these have to work together to be an effective succession management system. We can't have some aspects of our HR system not working in conjunction with the um, with our, our succession management plan. So all of those things need to work together in harmony harmony and in alignment to ensure that successful management works for our company. We always want to be thinking about, you know, continuous improvement, continuous improvement always. 
what are some good succession management tips? Um, I like Table 10.3. Um, they have uh, uh, you know, six basic ideas of how to keep succession management as successful as possible. Number one is keeping it simple. As always, if the more complex the system, the least likely people are to comply with it and to take shortcuts. So if you keep it simple and direct, it's much easier for people that, um, uh, to comply with your succession management system. Use technology. Technology is your friend here. It keeps good uh, record of what's going on. It gives you up-to-date um, information on people's skill developments and developmental needs. And so at a fingertip, you can go online and you can see exactly what you need to know and update records on, on, a, on a very rapid basis. Um, we want to make sure always that you are aligning your succession management plan with your overall business strategy. If your succession management plan does not work in alignment with what your strategic goals are and what's important to the company, don't bother doing it because it's going to work at odds with your corporate strategy, not support it. Everything we do in the organization, I'll say it again, everything that we do in the organization should be to support the firm's overall business strategy. Everything. And so if what we're doing in HR or accounting or marketing or production, if it doesn't support the business strategy, we should not be doing it. And the same thing with succession management plans. Focus on development, right? Training is about making sure people have the skills to do their job today. Development is preparing people for the internal labor market and for promotional and transfer opportunities in the future. So we want to make sure that if we want a good succession management plan that our focus isn't on reactively addressing skill gaps but in proactively getting people ready for future job opportunities. We want to make sure also that we model effective succession management behaviors at the top. Our top management team needs to engage in development of the people below them, setting a good role model for what they expect others to do. Um, so it's also important that they follow the succession management plan. Um, and so if you tell people you've got a great succession management plan and then you don't use it, for filling in your gaps, um, you've just told people that this, this plan is useless, why bother? Lastly, we want to approach succession management as a key business activity. It needs to be uh, included as an important activity like any other resource management um, activity, whether it's managing our budget, managing our financials, managing our investments, we have to manage our people in the same way. An important part of uh, internal applicants or assessing internal applicants is to understand career planning specifically. Um, what are the career stages? Where are people at? And what are the most relevant issues we need to consider as people are in different stages of their career? So career planning is this constant um, uh, job of people self-assessing, where they are, what they want to do, what their goals are with respect to their career, which is a larger issue, and particularly their career within the company. Those are two separate things. My career in the company may be very different than the career I aspire to um, in the larger, um, in the larger uh, context. Um, and so the more that we can get those in alignment, um, the better off we are. But we also have to recognize that many of our internal uh, employees may have career aspirations that go beyond the boundaries of our organization and we have to um, sort of recognize that there may be some conflicts there between what we want for them in their career and what they actually will, will want to do for themselves. So career planning needs to complement um, the expected future talent needs of the organization. So we want to see if people's individualized career plans are in alignment with the career plan um, and the career paths that are set out in the company and then helping to get those things in alignment as best as we can. Um, well, as it says here in the, in the third point, when integrated with the organization's succession management and labor forecasting processes, career planning and succession management can give us a snapshot of what we need. Absolutely. So all of these, these, these things that we've talked about in terms of planning and forecasting and um, uh, uh, career plans and succession management and all that stuff, 
all has to work in alignment so that we can make sure in any given moment we know what skills we have, what skills we need, and what plan do we have in place to make sure that those skill gaps are being addressed, whether it's through the training function or the development function in our company. There are a variety of career development tools that we can use, and they, they obviously they uh, map to the internal assessment stuff that we've already talked about. Assessment centers, again, assess where people are at right now. It identifies the skill gaps that they need, and it, and it becomes an input to the development plan for that particular employee. And it determines whether or not this person is currently a good fit or may not ever be a good fit for this type of position. And then that really will help them to understand that I know that you aspire to this particular promotion, but we don't see you having the skill set that would be ready for that. Now, I would, I would caution you in having those kind of conversations, particularly in dealing with assessment centers, is to recognize that um, there may be some bias embedded in some of those evaluations. Always be aware of any bias that may happen based on race or, or sex, um, and so that we're not telling people consistently who are not white males um, that they may not have uh, the good fit um, that we want to make sure we're not engaging in sexist stereotypes or racist stereotypes about who would or would not be a good fit for a particular job. So we need to get out of our heads and assume that everything fits within a white male box and that, that there may be different approaches to doing things that women could bring or other ethnic minorities could bring to the table that will help us um, you know, succeed as an organization. We can't always assume that it fits within the box of the way we've always done things. Um, so just my, my word of caution here is in this, these assessment centers, if we need to identify that someone may not be a good fit, we need to really examine uh, before we communicate that message that this is not based on um, uh, racist or sexist stereotypes about what is or isn't appropriate um, in terms of uh, fit for a job. Um, and, and to allow ourselves to be a little open to a non-traditional approach to things. We can also have uh, career uh, counseling and career development workshops um, to help employees understand their jobs um, and those career counseling opportunities are usually done in the development function of training and development and what we do is work with them um, and give them opportunities to engage in seminars or webinars or what have you to learn more about how to grow in skill sets that are important for the career path they see for themselves. People come in to a company at an entry-level position, but it doesn't mean that they there's a, there's a really clear progression from lower to upper level where they're going to move. Oftentimes, people come into the company and they may move laterally to a different department because they find that their skill set is much better suited for a different area than they initially thought. You know, when we, for all of us, when we start working, we assume that we have a skill or desire in a certain area and ultimately in the end may end up going in a very different direction than we initially thought. Um, training and continuing education. Again, career development works hand in hand with the training and development function, making sure that people have opportunities in a formal education scenario, like in a college, um, grad school, what have you, or in, in training seminars that pop up that, that the company makes available. Job rotation and um, other challenging and reach assignments and mentoring, also important ways to develop people, pushing them to um, get experiences in broad different areas so that they can reach out. Um, and don't assume that your reach assignments are all necessarily within the within the confines of their job. Reach assignments can also be non-traditional approaches to things. For example, um, if you are having a blood drive, you know, you want to have a blood drive on your in your um, company and sponsor a blood drive in the community, you might put one of your employees in charge of planning for that because it's a good developmental opportunity for them as well to examine how to manage multiple resources, how to plan a project from beginning to end, how to make sure all of the um, uh, the steps are in place to make sure that the um, uh, that the project comes to, together successfully. So you can always uh, turn to non-job um, projects like, you know, philanthropy or um, other sort of voluntary projects to really give people the skills that they're looking for. Sabbaticals are also important, particularly for employees as they get higher up, they get locked into a job. 
giving them a sabbatical, and, and, which means a chance to get away, to do something developmentally for themselves without having to worry about the day-to-day -day grind of their job, will really help to re-energize them. And that's why in academia, every seven years, faculty members are given the opportunity to take a sabbatical, which means they get to work on a research project um, or do something unique that re-energizes their skill set and that it benefits uh, the organization um, um, through you know, teaching, research, or service, whatever that might be. Last, we want to make sure we give people challenging and developmental job assignments um, to enhance their key competencies. And again, it, we talked about sort of non-job assignments and how those can be very beneficial, but even within the job, making sure that we're creating opportunities for people to develop those incremental skill sets that they need to be successful. The most important thing any employee can do for themselves around their own career development is to not rely on the organization to do that for them. I can tell you best practices all day long for why organizations should do this, but there are still organizations that may choose not to engage in really good career development. Um, so my recommendation to you is to take your own career into your own hands. Assess yourself know what you want to do, know what your strengths and weaknesses are, set your goals, decide this is what I want to accomplish by a certain time, make sure you work with your boss or your boss's boss to, or your mentor in a company to help get those a proper and appropriate goals set and then the steps involved in getting there. Develop your own action plan, right? Well, again, you work with your boss or your mentor to make that happen, but you've got to have a, a concrete plan in place what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, why you're going to do it. And then always go back to that career development plan to see if you're on track, if you're following the track. Um, so you, know, you might have a three-year goal or a five-year goal or a 10-year goal of what you expect to see, but you should have a career plan, an action plan in place to help you get to that place incrementally. We evaluate internal assessment very similar to the way we uh, evaluate external assessment. And it could, we have to make sure, first of all, that we're using valid tools for predicting whether or not an internal candidate will be good in a new opportunity. Oftentimes, we use performance appraisals because we assume if someone is a good performer in a current job, that assumes that they'll be good in a promoted job. And that may not necessarily be the case. You may, you may find that an individual has reached their fullest potential being in a particular position and advancing beyond that, they're just not capable of it. And there are plenty of people where that's true, where they're good working independently, but once they need to work with others and manage others, they're not very good at it. So we want to make sure that we're using valid tools that are related to um, job performance. And so performance appraisal is only good in a narrow range of, of, of activities for similar types of jobs. So we can use past performance appraisals only when they are related to similar positions. We also want to make sure we're, we have a good return on our investment. Anything that we have paid, have we pay to do to invest with training and development for our internal applicants and our internal candidates it should give us a return on investment, which means that they're more likely to be promoted, they're more likely to be higher performers, they're more likely to make the company more money in the long run. Applicant reactions, as I've also said, is incredibly important with internal candidates. We have to be very delicate in how we handle rejections when it comes to internal applicants um, and, and make sure that we treat them fairly because if we don't treat them fairly, not only are they less likely to apply for promotional opportunities in the future, but the word of mouth gets out incredibly quickly um, and may deter others from also um, applying for internal promotions. And then we have just destroyed you know, our internal assessment system um, and we want to make sure that we, we don't destroy that. So we have to be aware of the applicant reactions for internal candidates just as we have to do for external candidates. Lastly, we want to make sure we have a selection ratio that matters. And as it says here, having a low selection ratio means hiring only a few applicants, which allows an assessment method to have a maximal impact on improving the performance of the people hired. So our internal assessment method will actually help us to determine how to improve people. So if we have a really strict 
you know, low hiring rate, right, if our selection ratio is low, our assessments will tell us where their skill sets need to be improved um, and so that we can make sure that they have the skill set once they get into the organization. Usability, again, we want internal assessment methods to be simple and usable, which is why when we talked about succession management plans, we wanted them to be um, as simple as possible, easy to implement, because if people don't like it, if it's too complex, they won't do it. And then if they don't do it, we don't have the data we need. Lastly, of course, as always, adverse impact is, is important. And with respect to adverse impact, we need to recognize that if we, um, internal, if we advertise internally for applicants, um, that we are actually broadening our approach to make sure that we are um, um, actively recruiting people who um, have skills from all areas. If we only only use people who have um, that are in the direct succession, um, we may limit ourselves. We want to make sure we are open and, and we, we use targeted recruiting and we also use open recruiting, which means that we announce to everybody that opportunities are there because that gets us the passive job seekers, not just the active job seekers. Um, so we can reach out to people and we can also um, do general broad app, you know, announcements about job opportunities so people are aware that there are positions available. If you only limit it to a certain group of people, you run the risk of having too much homogeneity in your company. You want to make sure um, all of your internal assessment tools are providing opportunities for everybody to get promoted, everybody to have access to training and development opportunities, everybody has access to um, advancement and is, is part of a succession plan and, and as long as you are um, checking yourself to make sure that your assumptions about what fit is isn't based on uh, a normative approach of, of, of having the majority group continue to do the work that they've done, you know, you, you can be in a good place for minimizing the adverse impact of your internal assessment. Because remember, EEO law also applies to promotional opportunities. It's not just about external hiring. So we have to be um, really mindful of that.